All right, I got it figured out. Okay, thank you. So my talk is a quality HDR implant. My disclosure, learning objectives. So define HDR, HDR techniques in patient selection. Understand the steps to a successful and quality HDR implant and review workflow and discuss how HDR fits and is best applied now in 2019. So to start with, quality, we, this is, goes back to the beginning of implants, it re refers to dosimetric quality because we know that correlates with this endpoint of a good implant, good outcome. But I really want you to think about it on a programmatic level. So high reliability brachytherapy. Um, and I'll get back to the virtuous psycho, but um, high reliability is a buzzword in healthcare. A high reliability organization is an organization that succeeds in avoiding catastrophe in an environment where normal accidents can be expected due to risk and complexity. The path to high reliability is shown by a virtuous cycle. And so I wanted to demonstrate this here because it really applies to brachytherapy. And I believe through engagement and safety, you can not only have quality, but you'll have experience and efficiency. And it's not only on an organization level of, say, a hospital, it's on a programmatic level. So it's not just the quality of the implant. You're working on your program every day. So HDR and LDR. So HDR, of course, is high dose rate. I am discussing HDR. Um, though we usually discuss the differences, they are actually more similar than they are different. They are both first-line therapies for all in CCN defined risk groups, just like surgery. They do have similar outcomes. They have rare toxicities. They differ. They are, there's higher energy, higher activity, hap, higher initial capital, and there's different logistics with HDR. But again, they are more similar than they are different. And just a, a quick summary, oh no, is that HDR uses a fixed needle, just to make it real simple, a fixed needle where you can take advantage of various dwell times and dwell positioning, and you have enormous dosimetric flexibility because of that. There we go. So HDR techniques and dosings. There are variations on techniques and variations on dosing in HDR. Um, on the left here is ultrasound, in the middle CT, on the right MRI, and CT and MRI go together. As far as dosing goes, um, in 2012, 2014, we had uh, appropriate criteria, we had consensus, and it differs from what I'm showing you here. This is more of an evolved dosing, it's practiced today by, by most centers, so monotherapy for me is 27 gray in two fractions, one to two weeks apart. Boost is 15 gray times one, well established, you can do two fractions. And salvage therapy is very common, published, prospective data, phase one, phase two, to demonstrate how to do that and dose it. A couple of different variations. There are contraindications to HDR brachytherapy. Mira brought this up earlier, just contraindications in general to brachytherapy. And like she said, you're not going to see someone with an ATM, and nor a rectal fistula. But you will see somebody that you don't think is a good OR candidate, and I want you to think like a urologist. There are patients I see that we should not put in dorsal lithotomy position, and it's something urologists have taught me. You've got to think about their hip, their back, what you have to put them through to have a successful implant. And there's also relative contraindications to HDR brachytherapy. Um, I look at these more like opportunities in my practice today. We talk about bulky disease historically, but really HDR is ideal for it. Talk about size being a criteria to avoid. I really don't see that. I published on that, and um, no, nor do other experts as well. You don't have to be an expert to get a good implant with a good sized prostate. LUTs, I, I will say I work very, um, I work in a multidisciplinary setting. About a third of my patients go to surgery, a third get radiation, a third go to active surveillance. I talk men into surgery every day. I do feel there's a quality of life benefit to surgery with high LUTs, but we don't make these decisions. You know that if anybody has seen a high volume prostate, um, has a high volume prostate clinic, we don't make these decisions. But so when a person does choose 
brachytherapy or radiotherapy, you can best guide them. And, and I think you can select men with high LUTs for HDR and have a good outcome. Arch, prior TERP, I, these are not problems. You, remember, you have a fixed needle. You can identify the TERP by MRI. You can use gel. You can use contrast in your CT. You know where it is, and you can constrain to it. You have this enormous dosimetric flexibility with HDR. Large median lobes, of course, you can deal with that surgically, but if that's not an option, you can do a mini TURP, come back three months later, and do a very effective HDR implant. In prior radiotherapy to the pelvis, say in a rectal cancer patient or someone had, that's had prior beam, this is actually ideal for brachytherapy, and I favor HDR in my practice. So the patient workflow. There's two different ways to do HDR. We've gone over this once, but I just want to point it out again. There's the CTMR based and there's the ultrasound based. On top is the CTMR based. It does take hours, not physician time, but patient time. You start in the OR, you place your needles, and then you send the patient to the PACU. And then ultimately, in my practice, they go to radiology, they get a couple MR sequences over 18 minutes, they get a CT. We're already working on those images. About an hour and a half later, they come to my clinic. They get a 10-minute HDR treatment. We pull the needles. They go back to PACU and go home. This does take four to six hours, but it's not physician time or ne necessary your, your team's time. Ultrasound is different. It's in a shielded OR. So a very efficient team can be in and out of the OR in 90 minutes. That is very true. But I would plan as you start up perhaps three hours, maybe even more. Um, again, it's not where you begin, it's where you end, and you need a, this virtuous cycle. You need to en engagement, safety, and you'll have efficiency, you'll have quality, and you'll have experience. So let's talk about OR presence. Um, again, building high reliability. Um, this is the biggest obstacle I observe. It's the hardest thing to treat. So before we even talk about the implant, let's talk about how you go to the OR. You have to know the beginning of end and, and end of it. You have to engage and in, in, invest in safety because that leads to quality, efficiency, and experience. And what I'm telling you to do is be vocal and be directive. I want you to engage the room and rid power differences. And I actually make a statement every case after the timeout. I say, if any member of the team sees anything unsafe, please speak up. It's a way of ridding power differences. And actually, in, in my goal is ultimately that anybody in that room at the end of the case thinks to themselves, I would feel safe in this OR, and that's key. So on to the procedure. Quite simple compared to LDR in, in, in my world. Um, this, these are the steps, and I'm going to highlight a few of them, but first, you review the plan, you go to the OR, you position the patient, you prep and drape, you go to a timeout, place the Foley, you get an ultrasound image, very key for CTMR based um, is that you do a marking block. You use gold markers if you don't already have them in place. So I say photobomb here. Part of the CT markers and part of just staring at your ultrasound is get an idea of what it really looks like. If you're only doing CT contouring, you need help. And that's why I use an MR as well. But I also place gold markers there because I translate that onto my CT later in the day. So then you go on to needle placement. First, I go I place all my needles, axial mid gland, switch to sagittal, or, and then I pause, for, sorry. After that, I drop the legs. Very key to mitigating needle migration throughout the day. You drop the legs, you secure the template, and you, so that's when you use a suture. And then you go back to your imaging. I generally go to sagittal imaging at that point. I advance all the needles to base, and I'm done. On to cystoscopy, it's optional, but it is often beneficial. Foley to drainage, or you DC it, a BNO suppository for patient comfort, and then I transfer to a CTMR immobilization board. Again, this is how you mitigate needle movement. It's a very thin board that you just slide the patient around during the day. You're really not moving them. You're just sliding them, and you, have, you end up with very little needle movement. Okay, items unique to CTMR-based prostate HDR when you're in the OR. I use Marcane. Um, I also have a, I make sure everything is MRI compatible. I use gold markers. That's a monotherapy patient. Usually my patients that have had beam have markers. You use suture and you use a BNO suppository. So just an additional checklist for you. All right, pre-plan. Pre Most experienced docs are not doing a pre-plan. And just to raise a hand, anybody that does HDR, do you do a pre-plan? 
No. So I'm just telling you, do one. This is a point of engagement with your team. Everybody wants to know what you're going to do. So very simply, this is, you know, um, in MIM. I just print an Axio image. This guy is Spacer. This is from his initial simulation. And I just tell my physicist, this is what I'm up to today. This is a 16 or a 14 needle implant. And then I take it one step further. And on the upper left there, I can't point at it. I apologize. But you see my checklist and you see my pre-plan. That way, everybody knows what's going on. And I love it when a urologist walks, walks in the room and says, awesome, I know what you're doing, because it is kind of a mystery what you're doing between the legs, and a point of engagement, a point of safety is letting everybody know what you're doing. So then you prep, prep and drape, and then you do a timeout. Okay, so a timeout is what the Joint Commission defines as a, an immediate pause by the entire team to confirm that it's the correct patient, procedure, and site. We verify allergies and antibiotics, and that's just what you need to do. So this is your cognitive timeout. I was always taught to do this. And also, I live in Colorado, and if I don't post a picture of a mountain in my mountain bike, then I'm, <laughs> yeah, negligent. All right, so on to the imaging. So the first thing you do, you get a good image. I always keep the urethra in the D row, never vary from that. You may have an asymmetric prostate. If it's in the D row, you always know where it is, okay? The second thing is we can talk about the angle of the probe and stuff, but really you want the, and you can focus on the degree angle. It's really you want an angle of a probe that's parallel with the posterior aspect of the prostate. That's what, that way you always know the plane that your needles are going in. Okay, on to the marking block, sorry. On to the marking block, okay. So you're gonna hit this triangle, and what I'd like to point out, what you can see on the upper left there is actually the balloon in the bladder. This guy has a terp defect. Um, and so you see the bladder on the upper left, you see the prostate on the right, and below that the seminal vesicles. There's a triangle there, all urologists know it, they use it when they numb up for biopsies. That's what you gotta hit. And then gold markers at the same time, you can see on the left there I hit the apex and base. That translates to good contouring of the apex and base on CT. CT is Obvious under, uh, obviously underwhelming to everybody in this room. Give yourself any tips you can to be true to the true anatomy of the prostate. And then if I do have a marker in place, I can measure to the apex and base just before I start the case. And I can take pictures of it. So this is, apologize. This is the marking block. So I'm at, this is sagittal, I'm at midplane. You see my urethra, I, I rotate laterally. I kind of find my triangle. You can see my triangle in the space here. I hit it with my, my needle. I leave behind 10 to 12 cc's of quarter percent marcaine. You can do a pedentum block on the way out if you care to. It's really not necessary if you do this well. I rotate over to the other side. Needle in. Find it. Okay, happy with the position. Do it all over again. Voila, you're done. This will numb them up for six, eight hours. It's essential. Okay, now we're on to needle insertion. So first I go to mid-plane, and I take my, again, I have this idea of a 14 needle implant, 16 needle implant, and I advance them all in mid-gland, and then ultimately I'll advance in sagittal. So that's the initial 14 needle placement. A couple tips on this to get IODO geometry. You place the anterior needles and the peripheral needles first. This avoids the shadowing that you're gonna get. The spacing is about eight to 12 millimeters, about a centimeter, but you do crowd the posterior um, capsule, about three to five millimeters inside the capsule is about ideal, more, weighted more towards the rectum than the urethra, and you always insert that posterior row deep into this SVs, and the higher the wrist, the higher I place them, and it's easy to get them in 10 to 15 milli millimeters or so, and you can see how that translates into the dosimetry of treating the SVs later in the day. So needle placement, I just want to point out something here that Dr. Frank um, focused on too. Where you get a stricture is, is at the GU diaphragm, okay? So when I place my two anterior needles, I'm constantly rolling in and out of the prostate to know where the path of that needle is. And I roll all the way out to the GU diaphragm, and I want to split that penile bulb in that, um, in that bulb or urethra. I, in doing that, I'm going to protect the urethra. And you always want to know where those needles cross in. Okay, so that's the point where you have the needles in mid-gland and you drop the legs. This is for CTMR-based um, HDR. You drop the legs, you release the template, and you secure the template. Key step to avoid needle mid, um, migration during the day. And then we're off to 
um, putting the needles into base and you can see uh, on the left there is the Foley balloon. I kind of float it in and out as I'm trying to see where the base is and I'm advancing my needles. The lower needle there is deep in the SV and I'm just kind of slowly going through one needle at a time advancing to base. And you're placing these really uncomfortably deep compared to LDR. I'm placing these, that you have six millimeters of offset at the end of a needle. Um, it's been talked about putting them in a centimeter beyond the prostate. You can do that safely every time, but it's uncomfortably deep if your experience is LDR. So again, this is a point of engagement. We just, I don't know how to use a PC, sorry. Yeah. All right, point of engagement, we roll through here. We just say, what do you guys think of the needles? I'm going left and right, this is where I'm at now. You have complete control over the needle. You see a needle, you don't like where it is. You put it in deeper or you pull it back. You have complete control over this. So. And then cystoscopy, it's not necessary, it's optional, but it's sometimes beneficial. And this is an anterior needle right here, you can see. And we identify it, and then I just have to reach between the legs and pull it out, resecure it, and you're off to the races. But again, a key step to mitigate side effects. All right, so now you've done an implant, and then you're off to the rest of the day, which is treatment plan, imaging, contouring, and treatment planning. And I have two more slides, and just kind of taking a step back. So this was presented this summer at ABS by Joe Shu. Um, this is the 10-year uh, medium follow-up and results on RTOG 0321. So it was done in 2004 to 6, 129 patients, 14 institutions. This was CT-based, so two-fraction CT-based boost to external beam radiation therapy with mostly unfavorable, um, unfavorable intermediate risk guys. Very few favorable, 30% high risk. And these results are, I, I really think, exceptional given the, the time it was done. So at 10 years, 6% prostate-specific mortality. At 10 years, only 5% grade three GU, GI toxicity. That's just a couple cases of obstruction and incontinence and one case of cystitis. It's pretty phenomenal. CT-based MR or CT-based HDR at 10 years. And then another thing is they had 98% local control. So compare this to the external beam series you've thought about. So this is 98% of the time. There is no disease recurrence inside the prostate. And then finally, you know, the future is now really with integrating MRI. As I've given this talk over the years, it was always, you know, the future is MRI. But, you know, I'm sick of the excuses. I, I mean, I just can't imagine. I mean, I just want to show of hands. Who has used an ultrasound to plan the treatment of a brain tumor since 1995. How about a CT? MR is really uh, available now. You can direct plan on MR. My problems in the past have been able to, can I see my needle on MR? You have all sorts of needles. Can I see it? And can I register my MR to my CT for planning? You can direct plan on MR now. Those things are solved. This is a series from Matt Bajoli out of Florida, um, 174 patients, direct planning on MRI. He shows the feasibility of it. This is all with patient, um, forward plan patient reported quality of life, especially on sexual dysfunction. He shows here how you can delineate the prostate better than any other imaging we have. And you all use external um, MR for external beam for prostate. I know everybody does. And you can find a lesion, but you can also identify the neurovascular bundle. And we know that ED is our biggest side effect. And we know we're not the only variable for ED. However, if we know the dose that affects ED the most when you do brachytherapy or any external beam, then you're leagues ahead of everybody else. And only by MR can you get there. That's my belief. So thank you. <laughs>